I want to transition to getting back to EGFR. We talked about the, you know, uh, targeting EGFR in the first line setting. Ed, um, I want to come back to you and just kind of, is there a rationale for targeting EGFR with a TKI? I, as long as I live and I still have that slide, and believe it or not, in the last month, I have shown that slide from BR20. Well, you, you know the slide I'm talking yeah. about. Were you, were you at a reunion of some sort? Or what? <laughs> male, male smokers with squamous cell, yeah. you know, or Lotinib yeah. versus placebo, and a doubling of the median, you know, from yeah. two and a half months to five months you know, in the mm -hmm. second, third line setting, and, you know, suggesting that it's an active agent, at least for. Um, OS. We, I don't. I don't ever anticipate seeing responses. But if you can slow progression, maybe that's enough. Yeah, and I think it's again how we talked about that earlier with what we consider what's an active versus not active agent right. or not. I mean, placebo is a pretty inactive agent, although you know it's done okay in some arms, which kind of just tells you from a humility standpoint. We as scientists, researchers, and clinicians don't have it all figured out. Yeah, talk to Karen Kelly about placebos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. So, you know, I, I think when you're dealing with an unselected population, which we're talking about a pathway here that exists on, you know, how many cells in your body, a good percentage of them, uh, 90 plus percent, uh, it makes rational sense to target that receptor. But again, being so uh, omnipresent, it, it really dilutes out. And, and then getting into the clinic where we're all clinicians, you know, one therapy versus another, cytotoxic chemotherapy versus an EGFR drug, uh, again, I think in an unselected population gets diluted out. And so do I, have I always believed that these, these drugs, these oral EGFR TKIs, as well as the IV ones before, had activity in patients uh, with lung cancer, specifically squamous? Yes. Uh, have we seen that with the IV drugs, not so much as single agents at all, but in combinations only modestly? Uh, and as with pills, I think we still have that data. It still exists. Um, but we now know that not all these drugs are created equal either. Right. And we see that both in non-squame and I think we are in, in squame as well as non-squame, I think, with right. mutations. They're starting right. to cull each other out as well a little right. bit. So we had, you know, based on BR21, we had the erlotinib indication initially for second, third line, and then maintenance. And then, you know, all of a sudden, we, I think we all got the Dear Doctor letter in June saying that those were being... Um, uh, erased, if you will, and based on the IUNA trial. Who here knew that that trial was ongoing? You did? I knew. They yeah. told you? Yeah, I knew from <laughs> companies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't know that the, I the I, IUNA I think I knew, but the, the connection when they when they took away the approval, there was no connection that right. that was right. the reason why. So it, you're, you're it thought, went for years. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. I mean, because this, this was a maintenance trial. Well, uh, well uh, I mean, it, it is a trial of either Erlotinib as maintenance or Erlotinib as second line. Right, right, early and, and yeah, in, in, in the second line patients, in distinction to Saturn, where only 11% of the placebo patients got Erlotinib, right. here I think it was 77%. So it's like Erlotinib now or Erlotinib later. And this is the perfect design for a maintenance trial. It's the way that the, the, the immediate versus trials. delayed yeah, dose exactly, attacks exactly, study exactly, that Panos exactly, right. had initially done. Yeah. So if you want to ask the question where what's important, that you get the drug right away at the end of your induction or that you get it eventually, right. then this is the way you want to design the trial. And this right. is the, how this trial was designed. And in fact, there was no difference in the overall survival. Right. So it didn't matter. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a survival benefit to the drug. The Saturn study was positive right. when for overall survival when the drug was given as maintenance, and the BR21 was positive for overall survival when it was given second, third line. Granted, right. not a dramatic benefit, right. but so, a benefit nonetheless. So I understand the rationale of taking away a maintenance indication. I don't understand the rationale of taking away a second, third line, but right. that's not where I want to go. What I want to go, I want to go back to Ed, and I want to know, because we, we would, you know, we can argue about whether or not second, third line um, or lotnib has a role. But it seems like many people could agree with the following statement, it is not an inactive control arm. Getting to Lux Lung 8, right. and, and I want Ed's perspective on Lux Lung 8, which was in second line squamous, you know, before the immunotherapy, or a fat nib, a second generation TKI, versus Erlotinib. Thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, I, you always hope that as you get more generations and newer generations, they are going to be better with at least not worse toxicities, et cetera. Uh, this was a head-to-head. 
And so, you know, I mean, for years when we were in the Jafitnib and Erlotnib era, and, you know, we were trying to be convinced that we should use mm -hmm. Erlotnib, it was, where's the head-to-head? -head? Where's the head-to-head? -head? And we never got that, but, and we didn't need to because, obviously, Jafitnib, you know, was taken away from us, and so we didn't have any choice. But we now have head-to-heads, and this is uh, one of the head-to-heads is Luxlong 8. And, you know, again, although modest, still was a month better in survival than Erlotinib, and I think in a second line squamous patient population, that's meaningful enough. Uh, again, you can't compare this to IOs or other things. Right. That's again now taking the landscape. But when looking in the realm of oral TKIs against, you know, treating with docetaxel in a second line setting, gosh, I would pick uh, a fatnib or or previously erlotinib. Uh, to do that. So I, I think the data is meaningful. I think the toxicities weren't uh, uh, something that scares you away. But uh, again, uh, it's about management. To erlotinib, nobody knew how to manage 150 of erlotinib. And people started, you know, using 100 and 75. Same thing happened with a fatnib. You know, people got, there were 50 was a dose that was tested early on, and that was way too high. 40s can be tough in some folks, but mm -hmm. we have people at 30 or 20, and they do just fine. Yeah. I'd much rather have them on it than a cytotoxic. Yeah. So uh, has, has Lux Lung 8 impacted your practices? Where it impacted my practice, when I first saw the data, I, I thought the win for a fatinib from this trial was going to be outside the squamous setting. I thought the toxicity, um, finding that the toxicities for a fatinib and erlotinib were fairly similar. I thought it was going to be a win for a fatinib in EGFR mutated patients because of that toxicity comparison. I, you know, we, we've never been huge believers of the use of these agents in squamous cell patients. Again, not because we don't believe there's activity, but I think the real question, at least in my practice, is not is this better than placebo, or in this case, is it better than erlotinib? Is it better than the, the other options we have now currently? Yeah. And in almost yeah. all cases, I just feel like it's the, the efficacy benefit is And I would there. agree with that now, but if, if, if this data were three years ago, right. before the I.O. tsunami, right. Right. Yeah. you know, would you rather give a fatinib or gemcitabine yeah. or dosetaxel? Right. right. So. Yeah, it's really been relegated almost to third, fourth, fifth fourth, line. Fourth line for us, yeah, honestly. And, and the percentage of patients that make it to fourth line with squamous, you, right. you know, you can count them um, on a hand. But to me, it, it, and just as, as David talked about, it was also symbolic that it's a different drug, Yeah. right? Because, you know, mm -hmm. I think we started no, seeing think, yeah. some hints in, in mutant populations right. with deletion 19 data and others. Yeah. So not everybody was on board with that. Maybe now and everyone is still on board with that. But, you know, there may be differences right. between these generation inhibitors and, uh, and how they affect not only the general unselected population, but also the selected population. But on the other hand, we always thought in the wild type population that biologic effective dose was more important. I yeah. mean, we had erlotinib had a benefit in BR21, but gefitinib didn't. And we always thought that was because erlotinib was at its maximum tolerated dose and gefitinib wasn't. So Probably I'm not quite sure how that applies to the mutation population where they yeah. don't seem as dependent on dose, although it does give me some angst that they're not all the same. Right.